Professor Rachel Eisendrath is the chair of the Medieval and Renaissance Studies Department here at Barnard and an assistant professor of English. Hisham Matar is Barnard's Weiss International Fellow in Literature and the Arts and an adjunct associate professor in the English department. Tonight, we discuss his newest book, The Return, Fathers, Sons, and the Land in Between, a memoir detailing his return to Libya to uncover the disappearance of his father, a political dissidence, and the diminishing hope that he may, might be found alive. So I think what we have decided to do is I will give a very short reading and then we will, we will talk. Um, uh, I, have a, um, I have a fantasy of books arriving naked, you know, without a title or the name of the author on a shelf and you just pull it and start reading from the beginning. I haven't been able to go back to Libya for 33 years uh, when in 2012 I returned. Um, and the return um, brought up a lot of uh, emotions, but also it was for me very interesting to think about what it means to return anywhere. Um, and when I was there, I kept a detailed diary just because I don't know what to do with the world. So I, um, I do with it what I do with my work. I write. So I just kept a diary of what was happening. Um, of course, it's impossible to record everything, but some things that happen in the day. And then when I returned to my life in London, I spent three months not able to write. I didn't write a thing. I didn't even write a letter, which is very unusual for me. It never happened before. And so I thought, well, maybe that's it. You know, maybe I've, um, I won't write anymore. I'll have to find something else to do. And um, then I looked at these notebooks and really picked the first line from the notebook and then put it down on a page and thought, what might the next line be? Um, and so that's how the book starts. Early morning, March 2012. My mother, my wife Diana, and I were sitting in a row of seats that were bolted to the tiled floor of a lounge in Cairo International Airport. Flight 835 for Benghazi, a voice announced, was due to depart on time. Every now and then, my mother glanced anxiously at me. Diana, too, seemed concerned. She placed a hand on my arm and smiled. I should get up and walk around, I told myself but my body remained rigid. I had never felt more capable of stillness. The terminal was nearly empty. There was only one man sitting opposite us. He was overweight, weary looking, possibly in his mid-fifties. There was something in the way he sat, the locked hands on the lap, the left tilt of the torso, that signaled resignation. Was he Egyptian or Libyan? Was he on a visit to the neighboring country or going home after the revolution? Had he been for or against Gaddafi? Perhaps he was one of those undecided ones who held their reservations close to their chest. The voice of the announcer returned. It was time to board. I found myself standing at the front of the queue, Diana beside me. She had, on more than one occasion, taking me to the town where she was born in Northern California. I know the plants and the color of the light and the distances where she grew up. Now I was, finally, taking her to my land. She had packed the Hasselblad and the Leica, her two favorite cameras, and a hundred rolls of film. Diana works with great fidelity. Once she gets hold of a thread, she will follow it until the end. Knowing this excited and worried me. I'm reluctant to give Libya any more than it has already taken. Mother was pacing by the windows that looked onto the runway, speaking on her mobile phone. People, mostly men, began to fill the terminal. Diana and I were now standing at the head of a long line. It bent behind us like a river. I pretended I had forgotten something and pulled her to one side. Returning after all these years was a bad idea, I suddenly thought. 
My family had left in 1979, 33 years earlier. This was the chasm that divided the man from the eight-year-old boy I was then. The plane was going to cross that gulf. Surely such journeys were reckless. This one could rob me of a skill that I have worked hard to cultivate, how to live away from places and people I love. Joseph Brodsky was right. So were Nabokov and Conrad. They were artists who never returned. Each had tried in his own way to cure himself of his country. What you have left behind has dissolved. Return and you will face the absence or the defacement of what you treasured. But Dmitry Chostakovich and Boris Basternak and Nagib Mahfouz were also right. Never leave the homeland. Leave and your connections to the source will be severed. You will be like a dead trunk, hard and hollow. What do you do when you cannot leave and cannot return? You open your book and open this discussion um, by offering an image of an in-between state, um, a condition of being neither one place nor another. So you're in an airport in Cairo, um, neither having left Egypt nor um, having yet arrived in Libya. And you sit between your mother and your wife um, and exist for now between these different ages of yourself, right? Um, between um, uh, the past and the present. Um, you left Libya at eight years old, um, uh, just as a child. Um, but here you are as an adult, so there are these two selves. So to some extent, this in-betweenness um, might correspond with what we talk about when we talk about uh, a literature of exile. Your book is about something more precise and less familiar and maybe more difficult, the relationship of art to a set of brutalities that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Because I think the book does, in, in a number of ways, offer art as a way forward through that ultimate contradiction. And I wonder whether we can begin by thinking about how it does so, um, or let's say how it raises the question about what it means to offer words for what's unspeakable. Yeah. Um, the book is obviously has in it a lot of painful things. Mm -hmm. Painful for me to read now. Mm -hmm. But writing it was different. Mm. So when I was writing it, it was actually a thrilling place, mm. the book. That's the, that's the kind of strange thing to describe. Because when I was working on it, it demanded from me certain ways of, of engaging with the material, of balancing different, it had so many different registers. Mm. Uh, I really do think that your book is your fate, <laughs> you know, as a writer. You don't choose your book. You have, um, you have this, you know, I don't know how it happens, but a meeting occurs between a writer and a book. And the book has got its own character, just like the writer does. It's got its own uh, landscape, its own attitude, the things it likes to talk about and the things it doesn't like to talk about. And it's also got its own um, facilities. And this one, and why it was thrilling and why I felt lucky with it, even though it was leading me down places that were very dark and places no one would want to go. It was thrilling because <clears throat> it was like a, I don't know, like a, like a, really, like a really good horse mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, was always egging you on. Like, you know, I can, I can do cross country, I can gallop, I can canter handsomely, I can do all that, come on, step up, mm -hmm. you know? So it had appetites that always felt that they exceeded my own abilities. Mm -hmm. and, that's what you wish for as a writer, is to be in that space. Mm. But once you said to me that literature is a history of retrospect, uh -huh. of, it was such an illuminating statement. It says, uh, all, all books are written from the gesture of looking back. Uh, even books that are written about the future mm. are really about the past, right? The person who's written a book, when they do this and look at the book, mm. it's a very complicated space, mm. so, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that reminds me of a, a moment in the book where you're talking about um, 
the, uh, the relationship of your father in the present, right? Um, and, um, and you speak about it in terms of the, the complexity of the, of the grammar you'd have to be able yes. to um, yeah. give voice to this yeah. person that yeah. is somehow exists mm -hmm. somewhere between it not quite in the present because he's not with us, you know, um, and yet not quite in the past. That doesn't seem accurate either. So that there's something about the memory of your father as you're, as you're writing about him, as you're thinking about him, that seems to defy some of those kinds of, um, uh, that, that sense of what, of, of, of that strict division yeah. between past yeah. and present. Yeah, because when somebody, I mean, just to, to explain that my, my father is, is a, he, he, he's counted amongst the disappeared. So we're not sure if he, we know he's just through the laws of deduction that he's, he's uh, not alive, but how, where, when, mm. it's impossible to know. Um, and the quality of, uh, of engaging with his memory or engaging with, the quality of grief mm. is different mm -hmm. than when you lose somebody to death and you know uh, w w how they died, wh where their remains are. So yes, he's, he's uh, you know, I use that engagement with the fact that I don't have a grammar for him. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether to speak about my father in the past tense. You know, if I'm to say to you, you know, uh, you know, my father walks this way, or my father walked this way. I don't know, yeah, right. right? So, so that, but that to me is fascinating because of, of of what you mentioned, but also of what it it seems to express about loss in general. The the curious thing about how when people that we know have known well die, all these things happen after they die. Several th important things happen, mm. such as their our sense of them seems to somehow fill up their name starts to carry such resonance and meaning. Mm. It has enriched my understanding of what loss is, and that's what I am thinking about in the book. Mm. So how do you think the way that you're describing um, your relationship to, to writing and to literature, um, how do you think that compares with the relationship that you evoke to literature that your father had? I, uh, that's such an interesting question. I, I have, I don't know, yeah. but what I'm interested in is, is my thoughts about it are really, on some level, are my thoughts about literature, you know? So it's also, when I think about that, I also think of my desire of what literature might have been for him, mm. um, as well as what I think it might have been for him. Mm. But yes, yeah, so my, my father had a, he had a great memory for, for uh, you know, he, he, just, he just committed to memory pages and pages of, of poetry. It would be very difficult to think of a significant poet, particularly the modernists, he, he loved those. I'm talking about Arabic modernists here. That he didn't know, you know, half a dozen poems by, right? Um, and he used to say that if you, you know, he used to tell me that if you, you know, if you memorize a book, by heart, it's like having a house in your chest. Yeah. So his relationship was very intimate to it. And also these dinners that you mentioned, which, to, you know, to the boy that I was, because they took the entire, well, the whole energy of the house was focused on these big dinners where 30 people would come. And so at the end of these dinners, that's what I secretly looked forward to it, made sense of the entire madness of the, of the affair. Somebody would say, oh, come on, you know, recite us a poem. And then he would sort of feign, uh, you know, and say, no, well, no. And then someone else would say and it would build up. And he, I, I always felt like he was testing them. Mm -hmm. Like to what, you know, I'm not going to recite a poem unless if you guys are real believers, you know, you really care right. about this stuff. And then the moment he would start, I remember the delight I felt. And then years later, I, I heard from uh, relatives that were also political prisoners in Libya, but also other prisoners that I'd met, who some of them knew nothing of my father except that he was the man who, when, in the words of my uncle Mahmoud, who was a political prisoner, told me that, that um, when the prison fell so silent that you could hear a pin drop or a grown man weep quietly to himself, 
there will always be this voice of this. He didn't know who he was. His own brother, but he couldn't recognize the voice that would recite poetry throughout the night uh, in this steady, passionate voice. So what does that mean? I don't know what it means, but I, um, I like to think it meant that it, it was, you know, it offered him a kind of companionship. Um, literature as delight, but also literature as a kind of um, assurance, maybe. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I wondered in reading it also whether that he remained unchanged in some way, that yes. in a situation in which oh. all the forces were um, uh, designed to, to break him down, that, mm. that he did contain mm. a house within himself in, yeah. in some sense, right? Yeah. I think that was also my wish. Yeah. You know, I think he was changed. I think he was doing it partly for that, but partly also to be steadfast. Because yeah. he did feel that he was responsible for these other men and that he had to somehow inspire in them a sense of um, stability in this very unstable place. Um, because it, to me, it's always connected to this thing that one of the prisoners told me, this man that said, I. Uh, you don't know me, but your father like, was like a father to me. Uh, he said, whenever they would take us to be interrogated, there'll be this man, who would, it's called, if you get stuck, my father would say. He said, boys, if you get stuck, tell them that I, Jabal Matar told you to do it. <laughs> right? And he said, that was just amazing to feel that. So I think he was also playing, he was changed. Right. You know, my fear yeah. was realized. Yeah. He was changed into a role he had to play at that, at that moment. Um, and also, I think one of the things that the book does is that it's also invested in my, in my relationship, particularly in this issue of literature, it's invested in my independence. Right. Because this kind of fate complicates your independence right. as a man. You know, yeah, we you all talk, need a yeah. father to rage against. Mm. And when your father has disappeared, you know, that will is complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, he's won all the arguments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, best way to win an argument is disappear. You know? <laughs> so, but, so then how do you engage with that, with your love for him, for your admiration for him, but also for your sense of yourself? Mm -hmm. um, something else you said to me when you first read the book is you said that it, it's a space for consciousness. You know? mm -hmm. And I felt that was very, it's a very uh, true reading. That's how, how I... I felt I was creating a space in which all these things can, mm. can, can be. You know, my uh, allegiance to him, my allegiance to my own independence, my interest in, in art and literature, things that are very difficult to, they're very difficult to exercise your interest in, mm. in urgent times when mm. people are disappearing and, you know, to justify going to a painting mm. at that moment is complicated. Mm -hmm. so, so the book became a space for that, really. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the figures you evoke uh, a few, I mean, there are a few um, literary sons that you evoke, right? Mm. Like um, Edgar from King Lear yeah. and Hamlet and yeah. Telemachus yeah. from the Odyssey, right? Mm. Um, sons who have lost fathers. Hamlet, right? Mm. There's, um, I mean, there is that that dilemma of having this heroic father, right? And, yeah. and that the demand of the heroic father is, is to act. I mean, several of the yeah. li lines from those works yeah. have been with me for, throughout this whole time. Yeah. Since I was 19, they've been almost like objects in my pocket, you know, mm -hmm. that I relied on in some way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happens in the book is how some of those have shifted yeah. their meaning. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not stable. Right. I think that goes back to what you said earlier on about, about literature. I think literature is not stable. Another line that you, you mm. quote a few times is uh, from King Lear. Yeah. Of, um, Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. Yes. That's a moment in King Lear, right, where Edgar is leading his father, who's lost his eyes. In that case, the verge isn't literal, but it's a kind of edge of despair, yeah. right? And there, because he's just leading them out into the field, right? Yeah. Um, um, but I'm wondering why that particular line um, returns for you, and why that line is important. Partly because it's completely mysterious to yeah. me. 
why it seems to me one of the you know it's one of the mysteries yeah. <laughs> is why Edgar never tells his father who he is. Yeah. One of the things that comes with the fate of of a disappearance like that yeah. uh, is that you one of the fears is also it's the fear that the father would be so changed by the experience that he won't be able to recognize you. Because mm -hmm. one of the possible reasons why Edgar doesn't tell his father who he is, is he wants his father to recognize him, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and, um, and the other, you know, the other thing that that line, it's come to mean so many things for me, but one of them is the letters that my father wrote from prison, there were only three letters that were smuggled out after a long journey reached us. Um, the letters are written because there's scarcity of paper. The, the guards won't allow the prisoners to have pens and papers. So, um, so in one piece of paper, and it's covered. Mm. It's beautiful handwriting, but made very small. And it's from edge to edge, mm. uh, all the edges. So um, it's also that the father himself has come to his edges, mm. not only the edge of despair, but the edges of, of what is possible for him. You know. Um, so it's, it's, it's moved. Um, and I'm interested in how companionable you know, those lines can be, right? Mm -hmm. And how they, that's what I mean about them not being steady. Mm -hmm. um, uh. I think that's about all the time we have for today. Um, thank you, Professor Matar, for sharing thank you. your book. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Eisenberg, for leading our conversation. And Thank you to all of you for coming this evening, and to everyone, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.